Numbers 21, 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go up around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient in the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Gospel for the fourth Sunday in Lent is John 3, 14 through 21. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest the works should expose him. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Let's pray. Father, what a gift it is that you have given to us. The forgiveness of sin, new life, and the promise of life eternal in your glorious presence. A gift given because you love it, and certainly not because we deserve it. So open our hearts and minds as we hear your word. Continue to give us the gift of faith that we would believe, and that we would be thankful for what it is you have done for us, through Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was an English teacher. Well, maybe not that long ago. I think it's just 10 years now since I took early retirement from teaching. And a galaxy far, far away, well, you know, you could debate that perhaps. It was California, after all. It should not, however, then be surprising that as an English teacher, I am attracted to and really like what I call foreshadowing metaphors. All right, so I've taken two concepts from literature. The concept of foreshadowing, that is that uh, when an author writes a story, there is something early in the story that points to something that is going to happen later. That's called foreshadowing. For example, the story might begin with a storm and clouds and rain, and the author uses that setting to foreshadow that there are troubles coming ahead in the story. Or the author might then have that storm change and the sun come out, and that is a foreshadowing of a change and a solution to the problem later in the story. So foreshadowing. The other term that I like so much is the term metaphor. It's a term that we use more perhaps in poetry, but it's not absent from prose. A metaphor is a comparison that helps us understand something unknown by comparing it to something that is known. And in the comparison, the one is the other. It's similar to, but not the same as a simile, where a comparison is made between a known item and an unknown item, using words like like or as. So what we have in our scripture today, in the Old Testament lesson, and alluded to, not just alluded to, but directly spoken to in our Gospel today, is what I call a foreshadowing metaphor. Now it is a real event. What happened to the people of Israel as they were sojourning in the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land is a real event. But it is an event that God used to point forward to a greater event. And as we look at the event that we read of in Numbers 21, we then get a better understanding of what it is that Jesus came to do for us. So let's look at this event and its fulfillment, we might say, and also tuck into that uh, the understanding of what really happened in that event, as was written to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit to the Ephesians. As we look at the Old Testament event then, we notice that as the people were traveling, they're headed towards the Promised Land, but they grumble. And Moses, we believe, was inspired to write the book of Numbers, tells us that the people spoke against God. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. What we find in the reaction of the people to their circumstances is the reality of human nature. God had provided miraculously for them every morning, except for the Sabbath morning, and He made provision on the day before the Sabbath by providing double manna. 
and he had also given them quail. So they had this heavenly food, we might say, and they had meat. They had everything that they needed. And we also read in their travels that God provided so richly for them that their shoes did not wear out and their clothes did not wear out. God provided graciously everything they needed, and yet they became impatient. And they spoke against God, and they spoke against God's messenger and servant. And in their complaints, they called what God had given to them worthless. Oh, we humans, we are so that. It's alluded to in our lesson from Ephesians. We're going to look twice at this phrase, even when we were dead in our trespasses. So that's the circumstances in which we find ourselves, in our trespasses. It's an interesting word. We, in the liturgical church, use that word trespasses when we translate in the Lord's Prayer what is in the original language, debts. I was told by a lawyer the reason for that is that when the Bible was first translated into English, there, there really was only one primary law on the, on the legal system in England, and that was trespassing. I suppose it really is a leftover, or, or maybe a, a key component, a, a, a foundation of the feudal system, where it was illegal to hunt on the landowner's land, and if you did that, you were crossing into his land illegally, you were trespassing. And what the lawyer told me was that in that day, every transgression, every breaking of the law, had to be, when it was brought to court, put into the context of trespassing. And so when the Bible was originally translated into English, the concept of debt was not as powerful as the concept of trespassing, and so the early translators used that legal term in England to convey to us, to convey to their original readers, this sin. And so trespassing is crossing a boundary that we are not permitted to cross, and we do that when we sin. God has set up boundaries for us. God has set up standards for us. And it is our human nature and human desire to violate those boundaries to cross those boundaries against God's will and to do what he has demanded we not, or to not do what he has told us we ought. So we are in our trespasses. We are trespassers. We see this problem also in our gospel, where Jesus, in this conversation that he had with Nicodemus, in which is the very familiar John 3.16, we also read that the people loved darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. It is a statement about our human condition. Our broken human nature loves darkness, and we're using darkness and light here, obviously, metaphorically. We don't want our evil exposed, and so we try to hide it, although it seems that that is really changing in our culture, and light has become dark, and dark has become light, and we want the world to see that we are rebellious and trespassers. But the fact is that we have a problem that we are impatient, that we grumble against God, and that we loathe what He has given to us, that we trespass, that we love darkness rather than light, that we would rather live in our evilness 
And that's a problem. And the problem from that long term, eternally, is separation from God. Jesus used the word perish. Whoever believes in him should not perish. Should not be eternally separated from God. And we know that perish means eternal separation because it is contrasted to eternal life. So our rebellious, our, our, our rebelliousness, the fact that we speak against God, that we are transgressors, trespassers, that we love evil, results in this separation from God. The metaphor, the foreshadowing metaphor. What was the result for the people of Israel? The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. There were immediate and physical consequences and I suppose maybe even eternal consequences to those who rebelled. Those who were bitten by the fiery serpents which the Lord sent to them as punishment died. Many we see also then, when we go back to that phrase in Ephesians, it says that, yes, we're going to come to the solution. Fortunately, there is a solution to this desperate problem. But the solution came to me, came to us, when we were dead in our trespasses. What is the result of our sin? What happens when we rebel against God? We die. And we know death on a variety of levels. When sin came into our world, physical death came with it. Disease and decay and natural disasters and conflicts among people that lead to death either in crime or in war. Death on a physical level. But of greater consequence is the death that came on the spiritual level. And that's the death that Paul addresses when he reminds us that we were dead in our trespasses. There was no spiritual life in us. We are, from the moment of conception, because in sin I was conceived dead, separated from God, destined for eternal separation. So Jesus also said, whoever does not believe is condemned already. The context there is that Jesus' first coming was not to bring condemnation, it was to bring life as we're going to see. He didn't need to condemn because the condemnation had already been spoken. The law had already been given and we had already been called to put our trust in God. And so this is the condition. And the consequence, whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's the consequences of our impatience, our grumbling, our loathing of what God has given, our trespasses, our loving of evil. metaphorically foreshadowed in the death caused by the bite of the fiery serpent. The deadness of our spirits, the condemnation, a failure to trust, a failure to believe, a failure to put our confidence in what Jesus has done for us results in separation. So the people went to Moses and confessed their sin. 
We have sinned, they said to him. Pray to God for us. And God showed Moses the solution. He did not simply, however, remove the serpents or give immediate healing to the people. Instead, he had Moses craft a bronze serpent, lift it up on a pole, that when the people looked to the serpent at the command from God, they would have life. So, Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So then God, in his infinite wisdom, provided this very real, visible metaphor. The people had to look. The people had to believe that when they looked at the serpent, they would live. And when they acted in faith, they were given life. So we also read in Ephesians that this is what God did for us. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. What the people of Israel experienced that day was God's grace. He didn't have to provide a means of healing for them. He chose to provide a means of healing for them. Not because they deserved it. Not because they had done anything to endear themselves to God. But because God is gracious. And so... He called them to faith. He called them to believe that when they looked at the serpent, they would find life. And likewise, we, who have been bitten by the serpent and sin, when we look to Jesus, which is what Jesus said to Nicodemus. And he tied together this event in the wilderness with the grace of God through faith for us. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. We have a problem. We are impatient. We grumble. We even loathe what God has provided for us. We trespass. We cross the boundaries that God has established for us in our fellowship with Him and our fellowship with each other. We love darkness rather than light. That results in our death, our spiritual death. Being bitten by the serpent, we are destined to eternal separation from God. We would rather not believe, and because we do not believe, we are condemned already. But that is not God's desire for us. God's desire for us is that we live in fellowship with Him. And so Jesus was lifted up on the cross, just as the bronze serpent was lifted up on the pole. And He invites us, because of His grace, to believe that on the cross He died our death, that becoming our sin, He gave us His righteousness, that when we look to Him, we are forgiven. We are made whole. 
We are given life in fullness now and promised life eternal. Father, we thank you that Jesus was willing to be lifted up on the cross. So give us the faith we need to look, to see him lifted up for us in our place, that in believing we would have life. We ask in Jesus' precious name, Amen.